Hi, thanks for joining us online. We're always so grateful for the opportunity to connect with you, whether you're a regular here at LBCC, or maybe you're a fellow follower of Jesus Christ, or someone looking to learn more about Jesus and Christianity in general. Well, as a church, our aim is simple. First, we want to connect you to Jesus. He is the God who is the source of all life and goodness. And when you're connected to him, your whole life will change. And when you connect to him, you'll find that he wants to connect you to others, which is our goal too. You see, community is God's idea. We didn't come up with it. It's right there from the beginning of the story of scripture. Secondly, we wanna help you grow. Grow as a whole person. Uh, we want you to grow in your faith, obviously, and have a dynamic relationship with, with God through Jesus. But we want to see you grow in every aspect of your life. And part of that growth is when you join others on the journey of faith. There's something that happens when we work together, play together, and do things together that causes us to grow in relationship. And finally, we want to help you find ways to invest your life to be part of something bigger than yourself. You see, we were never meant to have life just be about us. It's really about learning to find a way to be part of something where you can impact the lives of others, whether it's your family at home, the people you work with in your neighborhood, your town or your city. We really want to see you get invested and impact your world. Now we hope you'll be encouraged by today's sermon, but first there's some information coming up here on upcoming events. Please look around our website, check out our YouTube channel, and hopefully we'll get to meet you sometime soon in person. God bless you, and may God's best be for you. Our Sunday service is back in person at 9.30 a.m. Masks are not required, but are encouraged for those who are unvaccinated. We also invite you to join one of our other events as an encouragement on your journey to connect, grow, and invest at LBCC. We host breakfasts for women and men on the second and fourth Saturday mornings. You can sign up at lbcovenant.org slash welcome slash upcoming dash events. Check out our live groups, a great way to meet and get to know us better. Some of them meet in person, some on Zoom. There are a couple times a month. And of course, visit our website or call the office at 732 732- 870-2028 to get info or ask for prayer. We'd love to help you in any way we are able. Now, here's today's sermon. It's good to be here. and Good to um, be able to share with you. I'm, I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage this morning. Um, when we originally planned this part of the speaking schedule, I had three Sundays, which was supposed to begin last Sunday. So when I'm preparing, I always th think of how do you break this into three different messages. And then, of course, I was not here last Sunday. So I have to make some decisions. And just so you know, this is free, no charge for this at all. It's easier to take three messages and make them one than it is to take three messages and make them two. Just, uh, just so you know, believe it or not. So uh, what I did was I took the three messages and, and just took a three-point, took three messages and made it a three-point sermon. Makes it easy, right? Just, you just can't unpack it unless you want to sit here for three hours. I don't have a problem with it. All I need is a stool so that I could get off my feet for a minute. So... Um, I, I've been reminded several times to, um, to announce this on June 11th. We're going to do our first in-person seminar on Saturday morning um, since the beginning of um, 2020, I think, was the last time we did uh, an in-person uh, notepad answer seminar. And I, I've been, um, let me back up a step. When I, when I prepare a message, it's usually something that I'm obviously, or should be obvious, that I'm dealing with in my own spirit, something that I really feel like God has given me. And there are things that God deals with me with that just are my personal things that I usually don't share from the pulpit. 
unless it's a good illustration of what he's saying to everybody else. And some time ago, I, I was um, reminded, Joanne reminded me of a, of a uh, time in our house when <clears throat> she woke up in the middle of the night. We have an Australian shepherd, some of you know, been to our house, have met Cosmo, a very vivacious, lively dog, at least for the first five minutes you're there. And then when you're leaving, he's also pretty lively. And um, she woke up to him staring at her. I don't know how that happens, but she woke up looking at this dog sitting by the side of the bed, just kind of staring at her. And she tried to pretend she was asleep. You know, if, she, if he sees your eyes open, he knows that's the key, you know. So anyway, 3 o'clock in the morning, here's the dog sitting there locked on her. And she realizes he's not going away, so she gets up with the dog. And she thought maybe he needs, you know, has stomach trouble, needs to go outside, whatever it is. So she goes, takes him out, goes and sits in the living room. Dog is real anxious, walking back and forth, just very agitated. And um, <clears throat> what happened next was that she let him out. Dog comes back in, nothing, still agitated. And when she's sitting down on the couch, she just sees a flash of light in the distance. And it's a storm. The dog heard the thunder before she ever did. Come to find out, dogs can hear five times further than you can. They can hear sounds five times further away than, you, than we can as humans. So he heard the thunder. And he had had a traumatic experience one time being locked in the house when, different story. So she, she realized that there was a storm coming and the Lord said to her, there's a storm coming, are you ready? That was in June of 2016. We didn't realize the storm that we were gonna go through begin in 2017. But here, here's, here's the picture. Years ago, over 25 years ago, I began to get interested in this subject called apologetics, which is basically how we give reasons for our faith. Not only do we demonstrate our Christian faith, but we should be able to intelligently discuss why we believe Christianity is the true religion. That our worldview, this sounds terrible to some ears, doesn't sound terrible to my ears, Christianity is the only worldview. Every other worldview is a false one. And you have to be willing to acknowledge that. People can have other opinions but there's only one true way to look at the world, and that's through the scripture. That you learn to see reality through God's eyes, and the way God sees it is the way he has spoken it to us. So some 25 years ago, I got interested in this subject called apologetics because I realized I did not have answers to people who were telling me that science had disproved the existence of God. I didn't have answers for, for the postmodern view that everybody has their own personal truth, that something can be true for you but not for me. I didn't have answers for any of those things. And Joanne and I, I you know, she's my sounding board for most of what I see in Scripture, if not all of what I see in Scripture. And... I always bounce things or, or talk to her about what I'm seeing. And we got into this discussion of how we realized the world had changed. That the world had, before our eyes at least, we saw it changing. And we sat up one night, for hours I think it was, looking back, thinking about what kind of world are our grandchildren going to grow up in if the if the trajectory we were seeing was going to continue into the 21st century? And would we be happy to not do anything about it? Would we, would we be content 
to just ride out our lives. I was in my early 50s, and we were pastoring a small church. We were content. We were getting paid. We, we, you know, I was still preaching, studying the word. Things were good. But we thought, if we don't do anything other than what we're doing now, would we be happy to face Jesus at the end of our days or at the coming of the Lord and say to him, listen, we did okay. We, we were fine with it. We got along. I was faithful to the word. Would we be happy to let our grandkids grow up in the world that we were seeing? And if it followed that trajectory? Well, let me put it in these words. I think these are more eloquent words. We saw the storm rising. We were like the dogs that could hear the thunder in the distance. And it was coming toward us. And would we be happy to just keep on doing what we were doing without changing anything? Well, when we moved to Charlotte, we made a decision for me to go to seminary. I'd been ministering for almost 30 years at the time. I think it was at least that, 25 or 30 years. And quite happy with myself. I had a good handle on basic the theological concepts, but I knew how to get people to find the Lord, knew how to pastor people, knew all those things. But I kept on thinking, should, should we do this? And Joanne was like, you, you, need, to, you need to go back to school. And so we started searching. I found Southern Evangelical Seminary, Dr. Geisler, became a very significant part of our lives, a very, very a prominent mentor in my life. <clears throat> and we, we moved to Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, I won't ask you to raise hands, but those of you who were there when I made this choice, what were you thinking? You were thinking, what is he thinking? You were thinking, what on earth is, is he doing this for? And I couldn't have said it, perhaps the way I did just now, that I saw the storm rising. Some of your kids were struggling with college because they were being bombarded with an extremely leftist, leftist ideology. Yeah? And they were challenging the authority of Scripture right to your face. Yeah. And I thought, if I, if I don't do anything, I don't think I could stand in front of Jesus and say, I did all that you gave me to do. And so, like, I don't do anything halfway. You realize that. I do it, just about everything I can do head first into it all over my head learn how to swim in it, which is what I did. And so today we, we look at this question. Let me do it this way. This is, I'll show you this. How did the world get so messed up, right? And we, we live in this thing, and the most, um, I guess the easiest way to describe it, it, it is a woke culture. And though it's kind of lost some of its steam, at least outwardly, it's become the mood of the culture. And if you're not familiar with the culture, with that term woke, come to the seminar, I'll explain it to you. Um, if you're not familiar with things like critical race theory, if you're, not con um, if you're not familiar with the progressive church movement, all of these things, they all pile together or they all interlock some, some way together. Intersexuality or interconnectuality. Um, I think it's intersectionality that is the word for it. What that means to us today. And how, um, here, here's the word that I would describe all of culture today, all of what's going on in the world today is destabilization. If I were going to put a, write a label or put a, a banner on our culture today, it's destabilized, 
and it's the process of destabilization to where everything becomes uncertain and it's destabilized. Start with the stock market. Look what's going on there. Look, look at, look at the, the country or our culture's um, perception of the rest of the world and everything becomes uncertain to us and it's destabilized and it's by design. Okay, and the answer, here's a, here's a really important point to understand, the answer is not political. But that's what the world would like you to think it is. The world would like you to think that the answer to this is political. Now, I'm not against politics. I think politics are interesting. I think they are useful to a degree. I think that God can use politics. I think he often does use politics. I think, I can't prove this for a fact, we usually get the leader we deserve. I mean, that's just my own musings. We, we, we normally get the leaders we deserve. And it's because of our inaction, not because of our action. But our answer, <clears throat> our answer goes back to this. Don't be, woke. Don't be woke, but awake. We, we need an awakening, and I don't want to use that in the, the sense of, of just a revival. I think a revival would be helpful, but a revival can also be more destabilizing than, than, than it can be to stabilize something. A reformation is more stabilizing than an awakening is or a revival is. So that, that really brings me to this scripture. Here, let, let me frame this a little bit better. You see how all this fits together. I hope you see how it all fits together. This problem, it fits together in my mind and I think everybody else um, sees this as well. This is from Acts chapter 2. It's <clears throat> verse 37 through 40. Now, this is the day of Pentecost. Now, the Jews were expecting their Messiah they did, even if, it, even if their expectation was not high, like this is the time. They, they had an expectation because they believed the scripture was going to be fulfilled, that, that God was going to send his promised one to, to the Jews to redeem them. And they thought mostly that it was going to overturn, listen, the political forces of their day. They believed that God was going to raise up a David that was going to destroy the Romans and reestablish the temple and the kingdom of God in Israel, and that life would be hunky-dory after that. Hunky-dory is the biblical word for shalom. How are you, shalom? I'm hunky-dory. It's my philosophical depth. Okay, now when they heard this, this was what Peter had preached to them, that they crucified Jesus, they were pierced to the heart. Very important thing that, that Luke writes there. They were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what are we to do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on urging them, saying, here it is, folks, underline this in your Bible, be saved from this perverse generation. Now, he was talking to the holiest people on the planet. These were the people that were given the promises, they were given the law, they were given the sacrifices, or they were given all of the, the, the feasts and festivals and everything else. There was no one like these people on the earth, and people said, P Peter said, be saved from this perverse generation. The world was not becoming more perverse. It was perverse 2,000 years ago. It was perverse 5,000 years ago. It was perverse at the call of Abraham. It was perverse at the call of Moses. It was perverse from the moment the devil 
said to Eve, has God said? And she saw it was a delight to the eyes. It makes one wise. Yeah. And took it in. That's when it became perverse. And you see, as much as America or the United States of America can be lauded for all the good things it's done, and I, don't, I really wouldn't want to live any other place on the planet. Maybe New Zealand. Talk to me later. As good as it can be, it has been perverse from the beginning. Man is perverse. We're just, we're just seeing that, not we're just seeing, we've always known our history is not without stain and blemish. And that when you put man in charge of anything, it will become perverse if it's not perverse at the beginning. And there is only one way out of this. Yeah? There's only one way to, to be removed from this perverse generation. That is to be born into another generation. And that's through Jesus Christ. Do I have the right crowd here this morning? Yeah. Next week I'm going to talk about this. Walking right side up in an upside down world. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what I think is going on in the world. But this is really what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be the demonstration of the kingdom of God. We're supposed to be the people that are proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he's the ruler of the universe, that God has a plan, and even history is in the hands of God, or even, even the future is in the hands of God, and he is ushering forward the kingdom to a culmination of a day when the end will come. That I, I, I've never been an end-time preacher. I've never been as a woe as me, you know, here it comes, turn or burn. Um, that, that's never been the mentality that I've had, but I, I, I look at what's going on in the world today, and I think, yeah, for generations, people have thought Jesus is coming soon. That, that's been going on since Jesus came the first time. The, the, those first disciples thought he was coming before they died, and it's been every generation then. And part of it is we should be living like we are the last generation. We should be living like he's going to return in our lifetime. And what do we need to do to prepare the welcoming committee for when he comes? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so here's three ways that you could tell the difference between whether you are a follower or a fan. I'm going to just, this is what I was going to do each time. One, one of the things um, that came to me was um, Blaise Pascal, who was a, a, a French a philosopher, apologist. He wrote, uh, he wrote, a, wrote several things, but one of the things he wrote was called the Pensées. And he said that there, more, there are more admirers of Jesus than there are followers of Jesus. Now think about that for a minute. There are people that admire Jesus. He's a great teacher. The Jews said, he speaks as one who has authority. I like that. Not all who heard him followed him. And today, I think we've got to look and see. Don't look at the person next to you. <laughs> Are they followers or fans? Because it's easy to say, yeah, I, I want to be where Jesus is. Yeah. That doesn't make you a follower. 
because you acknowledge God does something doesn't make you a follower. A lot of times this has happened um, when I've gone to a college campus to, to talk to students about their faith. I wish I could say that when I talk to a group of American college students that I find a radically committed group of young people that want to demonstrate the reality of the kingdom of God to all their fellow students. I'll tell you what I normally find. I normally find admirers of Jesus. They like him. They think he has good morals. Yeah. And they, they, will, they will embrace those morals. They'll even use those morals as excuses for not sinning, which is not a bad thing. But I'm a Christian, so I don't have sex before marriage. Yeah. That's the feeling I get from them. I, I don't get the feeling like they are radically committed to demonstrating who Jesus Christ is. And I have to admit that also when I go to churches, I get the same feeling. That I, I lived in the South for almost seven years, and I, and I came, away from, came away from my experience there, is that there is such a thing as cultural Christianity. It's just cultural to be a Christian. Yeah. Now here's the question. Would you die for it? I don't want to get ahead of myself here. That's the question. And I think that there'd be a lot more people that would be thinking that that's just an overboard question to ever ask anybody. But think about it. Think about it. So admirers are there, and then they're fans, basically. Rah, rah, Jesus. Yeah. Just look at the holidays. Gosh, look at the holidays. Let, let's just, what, what do they proclaim? What does Christmas proclaim to our culture? I got to buy something for everybody I'm related to. Or everybody who gives me a gift, I've got to buy something for them. They're not singing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Yeah. It, it, think about it. I mean, he, here's, here's the, the, the deception that I think we all swim in most of our lives is that we imbibe this without really proclaiming something different about it. Um, Christmas and Easter are the two, two most important Christian holidays. Easter, I think, should be, we should stop calling it Easter. We should start calling it Resurrection Sunday, or we should start calling it, um, I don't know, Jesus burst out of the tomb, or doesn't fit. No, you can't, it's hard. He is risen. It's, he's still risen. That's the whole thing. There, there, are, there are people that are just fans, and we're fans of it. You know, you have neighbors that love the holidays because they could decorate their house, and it's just something new. There's something emotionally attached to decorating your house. I never got that. Um, okay, I can't go there. <clears throat> the last one is, is perhaps the most disturbing one, and that is posers. The posers are imposters. They are knowingly, they are knowingly in being an imposter in the church. And they're doing it for ill gain. I've met some. I didn't think they still existed today. Paul called out some people who are imposters. They came in among us and, and basically were something other than what they appeared to be. And I, I like to call them posers. I don't know if the young people still use that word today. I don't know if poser is still a... I have, looking at one young person, and no, yes. It was a big thing like 10 years ago, but I know 10 years to a young person is half their life, so 
That's a long time ago. But you, you know, you, you, we, we should be willing and understand how to find someone who is a poser. Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits. Or by their fruit, you'll, you'll know them by the way that they produce in life. And, and that's really what brings us to this part. And this is perhaps the meat of what I want to say today. If this was a good hors d'oeuvre section, this is... <clears throat> it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, how many of you know that Christians did not have a good life when they followed Jesus? They didn't think they were going to become healthy, wealthy, and wise by following Jesus. They might become wise, but they weren't going to become healthy and wealthy. They might have good health, but there was always someone trying to change that status of their, of their health by either beating them, throwing them, and whatever. He said, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what good will it do a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Or what will a person give in exchange for his soul? Now, I, don't, I, don't, I think most of you know my wife and I, we went through a very difficult time. It's still difficult. Two years ago with our daughter getting sick and passing away. But... I have a hard time expressing my thankfulness for this and my gratitude for this. But it helped me see something very different. It helped me see the scripture very different. I started to see in the scripture how much suffering and how much pain there was in the scripture. I started to realize that C.S. Lewis said this. He said, if, if you're looking for comfort, I wouldn't suggest Christianity as a belief system. Now, those weren't his exact words, but basically that's what he said. He said, if you're looking for comfort, don't try Christianity. Because this isn't a comfortable place. And, you know, I always thought of that as a really pithy saying. That was, that was really, it was a nice, say, you know, something you could throw in there at the right place to make people kind of like, yeah. But it becomes real to you when you realize that you have suffering and that there, there, there are at least two verses in the scripture that suffering produces what Jesus is after. Isn't that strange? That we, we all say we want, to be con, we want to be transformed into the image of Jesus. Yes, how many want to be transformed into the image of Jesus? Yeah? Don't, don't we want every day to be more like Jesus? Yeah, or do we want like a holiday? Like, no, this week I'd rather just be my old sinful self. You know? No, every day we would like to be more like Jesus. Yeah? I got you here? Okay. Then suffering should be something we rejoice in. Because that's the only thing that changes us into being more like Jesus. James said, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. For the testing of your faith produces endurance. Endurance has its perfect work in you. Well, that's what we want. We want that perfect work in us, but we don't count it all joy. I still don't count it all joy. I still have some choice words to come up when I enter a trial that are not the godliest words that I should have. But the result is that when I submit to it, that it produces something in me that wasn't there before. So, <clears throat> there are three things, obviously. There are three things here. There's actually five, but there are three things here. He says that we have to deny ourselves. How does a selfish person deny himself? Yeah. How, the definition of selfish is that you don't deny yourself. Right? That's the definition of selfishness. Selfishness is I say, no, what about me? What do I get out of this? What's my benefit? Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, and if you give an altar call for people who want to become disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, you have to tell them that they have to deny themselves. 
Peter said, repent. That is a change of mind. That's a change of mind that reverses your, your direction. That's not waving at Jesus saying, yeah, I'm here. I'm still looking in the Bible where it says to, for everybody to close their eyes. I'm still looking for that place where it says to close your eyes and bow your head. I, it's open your eyes and lift up your head for the king of glory may come in. But where did that come from? The 19th century that came from. We don't want anybody else to know you're raising your hand, that you're making a public declaration that I will follow Jesus, so keep your eyes closed and bow your head. Is it only me? Am I the only one? Am I off the track here? It's, I want a public declaration that you are going to die with Jesus today. You're going to begin with denying yourself. You're going to see that it's not about me. Repeat after me. It's not about me. Listen, those are liberating words when you're in a trial. When you're in a hard time, you realize this is not about me. Paul says that when I die, life comes out of it. And Joanne and I, have we've experienced this when we're going through some of the hardest times. We look up and we say, it's not about me. It's the hardest thing to utter, but it's the truth. And when you, when you speak the truth, there's something that resonates in the invisible realm with your spirit and brings life to it. Jesus said you have to deny yourself. You have to realize it's not about me. If I'm going to follow Jesus, it's not about me being out front and everybody seeing me being the guy that is saying all the good things. No, it's not about me. It's about him. God has a plan. God has a plan that may necessarily not include all of you. You might be like Paul says, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. My life is just like taking that glass and spilling out the liquid on the ground. What good is that? Where is the fanfare? He said, deny yourself, take up your cross. Yeah? Take up your cross. See, I want to scrub all the religious vocabulary in my mind and in my heart. I want to just scrub it. I want to scrub and get rid of it. Because take up your cross, that was not a happy thing. You realize, <clears throat> you know, we see, a, we see a movie today and they always show the three pictures where the three crosses up on the hill of the two, two thieves and Jesus in the middle. Do you know that in, the, in, the, in Galilee and in Jerusalem, there were constant crucifixions going on? That the way the Romans dealt with somebody, here was their, the two ways that they could decide on your fate as a criminal. If you were innocent, they let you go. If you were guilty, they killed you. They didn't give you a jail sentence. There were no prisons. There were dungeons where they kept you until they crucified you. If they could separate you, it was because you were a leper, but more than likely they would just want to get you off the scene. And so there were constant pictures of men hanging on crosses, dying over days, as long as the Romans could put up with the stench. So there was this constant reminder of being hung on a cross. Jesus was, I'm saying this now, okay, I don't see this in the Scripture. Well, I do see it in the Scripture, but not plainly spelled out. Jesus was saying, if you want to be my disciple, just take a look around. You're going to suffer. Yeah? See, God has a ways and means committee. He knows how to put us under the burden of sin by giving us the desires of our hearts. See, God will resist us when we're sinning. But there comes a time, read Romans chapter 1, 
he gave them over to what they wanted. Yeah. And when God gives us over, we have the choice there under the, under the, the power of sin to cry out for help. Like these people did on the day of Pentecost. They said, how do we, we, we actually kill, we were waiting for him. We, we waited centuries for him. We, we've waited since Abraham for the promised one and we killed him. Think of the pain that they felt. It said they were pierced to the heart. Why? Because they killed the Messiah. And out of sheer fortune, they said, what must we do? How do we undo this? And Peter said, well, I've been waiting for that. Repent, every one of you. Be baptized in his name, and you'll receive the promise of the Father and the Holy Spirit. 3,000 men that day said, count me in. A few days later, 5,000 came because they realized what they had done. They realized what God was doing. And they realized that take up your cross was still part of the message. We're going to be outcasts, just like these 12 or these 11 men and, and the crowd that was with them were outcasts now to the Jewish community. And you read through the book of Acts, you read through just those first few chapters, they are persecuted for their beliefs. They're already beginning the suffering. All of them but one would die a, a miserable death, either having their head cut off, being thrown down off the, the pinnacle of the temple, have all kinds of things happen to them, and all of them suffered because of it. They took up their cross, and they suffered for their Lord. Look at Peter, Paul, what he says in 2 Corinthians, the list of things. You want to be an apostle? Here, sign up for these things. Three days, three times lost at sea. How many times beaten with a cat of nine tails? Thrown in prison. Robbers, everything else. This is what you're getting when you become an apostle for Jesus. How many takers do we have here? Yeah. So when we understand suffering is part of what we're supposed to do with Jesus. And it's not self-inflicted suffering. I can do that pretty well myself. It's, it's suffering because of the gospel. The things that we do. And when we are in the fire, that's when we have to see we are followers. That's when we follow him. Because when you go through the suffering, it's so easy to want to quit. But the following is an active following. Will you keep on doing what I've called you to do? Will you begin to be more firm in your declaration of my risen son? Will we live like Christians in, in the, the face of a government or a culture that disowns everything that is godly and everything that is true and everything that is beautiful? Will we live in that place as the church? Or will we just be fans? Because I already said it. Doom and gloom is not my thing, but I think hard times are coming on the church. If they haven't already. I think hard times are coming on the church. If we continue to decry the falsity of the narrative being imposed on us by the, by the culture, that we are wrong for being Christians. We are wrong for being for life. We are wrong for being for Jesus Christ. That we see reality. We see who the true oppressors are. And we claim to have the only answer that can turn around any culture. Or turn any culture around would be the right way to say that. That's what being a Christian to me is that we be a follower. At best, at best, or at worst, sorry, 
we should be able to say, let's make the best out of this. What's the best we can make out of this? That should be the thing that we, should, we, we can at least say that and then try to do the best we can do with it. Yeah. So it's probably the mercy of God that I did this all in one Sunday and not spread it out over three Sundays. Listen, I am convicted. I'm convicted that as I heard a man say not too long ago that I've seen more sunsets than I'm going to see in the future. In other words, we're burning daylight. And it's not time to slow down. It's time to ramp it up. Listen, most of you in this room, if not all of you, I'm sure most of you, are either parents or grandparents. Think of the impact and what kind of impact you want to make on your children and your grandchildren. Think, think of the impact you want to make on those that you come in contact with, who see you going through hard times, who know you're going through hard times. It becomes, for me, an opportunity to declare what I believe what I believe reality to be. Yeah. And to declare the, the name of Jesus as the only way that salvation can come to this world. Part of it, this goes into the seminar I want to do in the, on June 11th, <clears throat> is having an eternal perspective and not be dragged down into a temporal perspective. You have to believe in the invisible. Yeah. You, you, have to, you have to see the invisible is more real than the visible is. That's what, that's what 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and following are all about. For momentary light affliction. For momentary light affliction. But while we look at that which is unseen, an eternal weight of glory, while, that's a time word, while we look at that which is unseen, it gives us an eternal weight of glory. Yeah. Amen. So, <clears throat> June 11th, I sent out this on my email. Um, I'll, set, I'll remind everyone again. We just need to know whether you're going to come in person, well, those of you who are here should be coming in person. Those who are watching online, you can, you can get it. Uh, we're going to stream it as well. And um, you need to just let me know one way or the other at info at And we, we'd love to see you there. But the idea is that we want to see our role as a church in a woke culture in what's called a woke culture. Amen? Do you wanna, I'm gonna ask Les Taylor if he'll come and close. Thank you. There's a, I think two ways to respond to this message. One is to internalize it. It needs to become part of your thinking. You need to personally respond, say God, where am I walking in my culture and where do I need to depart from that and start walking apart from my culture? So you need to talk to yourself. The second one is you need to talk to each other about it because after all, we walk together in unity as a church. And so we need to talk about the fact that God didn't call us to a party, he called us to suffer. Interesting concept in today's culture, isn't it? Because we all want a party. I do. But we need to talk about what it means <clears throat> for us as a congregation 
to live out this message. <clears throat> God never promised that the church would be the most popular thing in our world. And sometimes when it becomes popular, it becomes, as Ray said, cultural Christianity. We want to live as Christ called us and as Peter preached. So talk to yourself and talk to each other. Let's uh, stand and close in prayer. <clears throat> Father, the truth about your scripture, the truth that you to relay about your church and your believers and the cost it the cost that is there to die for you, to suffer for you, to serve you, Lord, to follow. The cost is high. And Father, sometimes we have chosen to do that part way. But Father, help us to see how we as each individual and as a congregation follow in follow you, Lord Jesus, and respond to this word. Help us, Lord, to walk in purity and light, walk not as our culture walks, but as you call us to walk in your kingdom. We thank you for the, the time and the effort and the, the, the work that Ray put into this message to deliver it to us. Hard messages to hear are even harder to preach, I think. So I thank you for his service. Let your blessing fall on us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.